for all who struggle with the disease of addiction, the truth about our beloved. Stigma says, my child was a number. Truth says, my child was more than a number. Stigma says, my child made bad choices. Truth says, I was so scared. Um, I was so scared that I was gonna run again and that my mom was gonna bury her second child. Stigma says, my child was a junkie. Truth says, they need help. And why wouldn't we give them help if they really are sincerely interested in getting over their addiction? Stigma says, my child was selfish. Truth says, this affects everyone and it's so complicated. There's just so many aspects to it and um, it, knows, it knows no boundaries. Stigma says, my child was hard-hearted. Truth says, there's so much opportunity for growth. You know, there's so much opportunity to, to change and be a different person. We thank you for joining us tonight, everyone. I'm Colleen Marshall. And I'm Kerry Charles. Last year in Franklin County alone, nearly 800 people died through an unintentional overdose. Still today, Columbus Public Health reports 16 overdoses per day. Ohio has one of the highest drug death rates in the entire country. And tonight we are asking leaders on the front lines of the opioid epidemic how we got to this point and what we need to do about it. A step we can all take is to recognize addiction is a disease and start treating it as a disease. We are going to introduce you to a local doctor making a difference by putting his research into action. And we're going to sit down with seven individuals who share with us how their lives were overtaken by drugs and alcohol. Throughout our program, we will also have experts on our call for lines to help you get information you need and you can call them at 844-442-2554. And you might be looking for access to treatment, sober living, housing, or just a way to talk to someone about the substance of disorder use. Whatever your questions, our experts from the Columbus Rapid Response Emergency Addiction Crisis Team, DEA 360, and members of the recovery community are here for you. The number again, 844-442-2554. For the last 20 years, the Mark Wahlberg Youth Foundation has been making a difference in local communities. Most recently, the foundation joined the battle against addiction, in part thanks to the foundation's executive director, Jim Wahlberg, and his own journey through recovery. When you think about the Wahlberg family, you likely think of their current successes and not their humble beginnings. It was tough. There were nine of us, right? There was nine kids. My dad was a truck driver and my mom worked overnight cleaning bank offices. Uh, so there was not a lot of attention. It was, there was so much focus on keeping a roof over our head, keeping food in our bellies, right? That... Um, a lot of times, you know, we were left to our own devices to figure things out. The cops were constantly coming to my house looking for me or, you know, or they found me or I'm in jail or I have to, you know, my mom would have to go to court. And my mom, I wasn't the only one she had to go to court with either. Right? There was nine of us and a lot of us got in trouble. And my mother was the lady that would go up to the judge and say, lock him up. He needs to be locked up. He's dangerous or he's going to or he's going to get hurt. So, you know, I caused a lot of pain and difficulty for my family through my own brokenness, right? Um, so they suffered a lot, you know, and we went hungry on more than one occasion and we went without on more than one occasion. And we relied on a lot of community-based programs. Our parents relied on the Boys and Girls Club and the Y and other places to help raise us and in some cases feed us. Those experiences enable the Wahlbergs to genuinely relate to the people they are helping. Jim ultimately ended up doing time, and it was there that he found recovery and much more. Well, so, yeah, I found God. So let's, let's just put that right on the table. Mother Teresa came to the prison that I was in, literally. Like she actually came. Literally came to the prison. And uh, it, was, it was a very, very profound experience. It was, there were 800 people in the room and at a certain point when she was speaking, I, I felt like there was nobody else in the room. It was just her speaking to me. And, uh, and, and things, 
opened up more for me from that point forward. Later, it was a request from the family priest that set the foundation in motion. He had got transferred to another parish in a very, very tough neighborhood. And the, the, uh, the gym at this parish was sort of the centerpiece of the community, and it was falling apart. And so he came to us and he said, would you be willing to help us do this place over? The brothers used a premiere of Mark Wahlberg's movie, Planet of the Apes, as a fundraiser. And so we did that premiere, we raised the money to do the repairs, and my brother and I sat down and said, okay, now what? Mm -hmm. And that began um, the foundation. And it was, it was definitely a matter of responsibility. It was a matter of not being able to go home to my mother. If, you know, we're all successful and we're all, you know, living great lives and we're not giving back, then we're going to have a big problem with her. Being in long-term recovery himself, Jim felt a calling to get involved with the opioid epidemic. I kept hearing about people losing their kids. And I said, well, it's my responsibility to at least be part of a conversation. So they made a movie called If Only to be a conversation starter. And then the requests for showings came pouring in. It got to a point where I just had to say, God, I don't know what your plan is, but this is not my plan. So I'm going to go with your plan because that usually works better for me. Good choice. And, and so we've been around the country. But we just continued to do the work. And we know many, many people personally that, uh, that have lost their lives to addiction just from our local neighborhood. And now I, you know, I know thousands of parents personally around the country that had to bury their children. I have a child who was addicted, but he's in recovery now, right? And I, and I learned a whole new kind of pain, right? I thought I knew pain, and then I had a child that was addicted, and it's a new kind of pain. My whole life was recovery, and I missed the signs. I missed the signs, right? Um, you know, I, I was always chalking it up to something else, right? Not my kid. Right. And not my kid thinking not my kid will, will cause you a lot of pain and a lot of heartache. There's never been a scarier time ever for a parent when it comes to addiction than there is, than it is now. Right. Because so many people are have lost their battle. And so many of these young people have lost their friends and family members. Mm -hmm. Right. So they're suffering from post-traumatic stress. Right. And addiction and depression and all these other things. See, addiction is loneliness, isolation, separation, depression. And recovery is connection, love, joy, you know, community. And so uh, when you find that, your chances are very good. And now we're coming out of uh, a year and a half of isolation and separation. And, and I'm, I'm afraid of when we really get a look at the numbers of overdose deaths. Um, as a re over this last year and a half, I, I suspect they're going to be a lot higher. That's why the Mark Wahlberg Youth Foundation is pushing for a renewed focus on addiction and breaking the stigma surrounding people who are addicted. When you call your neighbor and say, my child has cancer, they bring you a casserole, they cut your grass, their kids wash your car, they do a fundraiser for you, they support mm -hmm. you, they love you, they hug you, they pray for you. When you call your neighbor and say, my child is addicted to drugs, they close their shades, they lock their doors, they avoid you in the supermarket. We love to stigmatize things, right? We love to look down on people in this country for some reason, I don't know what it is. We need to be kind to each other, we need to be loving to each other, we need to communicate, we need to talk to each other, right? And we need to stop judging each other. Well, Ohio is breaking records, but it's nothing to brag about. During a three-month period last year, out of every 100,000 Ohioans, 11 died of a drug overdose. That might not sound like a lot, but it is one of the highest drug death rates in the country. And for Ohio, it is an all-time record. It came at the height of the pandemic, and the men and women who are on the front lines in the battle against drugs say they are frustrated, but determined. I think there's a variety of things, including the isolation and including the fact that the economy was substantially shut down in the second quarter. Uh, so people didn't have the distractions of work and socialization. Isolation and the attorney general says access to federal stimulus money and drugs aplenty, a deadly combination. Some of the problem, geography. 
Well, unfortunately, that's right. We live, uh, if you're in Columbus, you're within 500 miles of two-thirds of the United States population. Federal drug agents say the Mexican drug cartels are using the same distribution routes they've used for decades. What they change up are their methods of transportation, communication, obviously, and what we're doing right here in Ohio is attacking the command and control of those networks and the command and control of the cartels. Hundreds of DEA agents in Ohio are trying to trace the drugs going into Mexico when necessary. Quite honestly, the cartels only care about one thing, and that's money. They want their profits. They could care less who they kill by getting it. Uh, and they, they could care less whether their product kills somebody or not. They only want money. On the state level, there are nine major drug interdiction task forces. The Ohio Organized Crime uh, Investigations Commission in my office, um, they're doing tremendous work. Uh, last year, they seized 27 pounds of fentanyl. Now, this is a drug that's so uh, dangerous that if you get a speck of it, if a cop gets a speck of it on their skin, um, they can fall out, they can overdose on the spot. But Yo says it's about more than enforcement. We can't arrest our way out because we've got citizens who really have become, I, I've talked to some drug addicts who say, it didn't take very much for them to get addicted. And most of them started with legal drugs prescribed by a doctor. So how much of this is on the pharmaceutical industry? Well, we think there are significant, there's significant responsibility there. Ohio is one of several states suing the pharmaceutical industry, hoping to force those giant drug makers to put resources back into the state for treatment and education. Yo says the average person who completes a 30-day inpatient treatment program relapses within 180 days and may attempt rehab a half dozen times before it sticks. This is not a weakness of character. I have a friend who was a Marine, got addicted by a prescription, just like you said, ended up losing everything when the doctor cut him off and he was addicted. Uh, he's a United States Marine. He doesn't lack in willpower uh, or toughness, but he didn't have what it took for years and years to get that monkey off his back. Finally, thank God, after multiple tries, it was successful and he's living clean and sober. Yo says his office is working on a research project that would identify genetic markers for addiction. So a doctor uh, who's contemplating a surgery for you would be able to give you a quick test and say, ooh, you've got the markers for opiate disorder, we're going to have to look at alternative ways to control your pain. New attacks on the crisis as the cartels look for new ways to stay ahead of the law. We are attacking these cartels and we're hurting them. I can tell you we're going to have record seizures in the state of Ohio this year and uh, it, it's it's going to it's hurting the cartels 100 percent. You've been doing this more than 20 years. Do you get to the point where you're just frustrated that this crisis is still with us? One of the hardest parts of the job for me is uh, speaking to a mother, a father who's lost a child to a drug overdose, uh, you know, wishing that we could have saved that child's life. Are you optimistic about the future? I'm hopeful about the future. Optimism means that I have data that suggests it's getting better. And right now that data is not there. But there's things in the works that I have hope that we're going to see better days. It's not just that somebody decides to wake up and say, oh, I'm going to become an opiate addict, or I'm going to start smoking two packs of cigarettes a day. When we come back, we hear from a local doctor battling not just the opioid crisis, but the stigma society puts on the disease. And we have a reminder, there are experts on hand to help you if you have someone you care about, a family member, friend, coworker, neighbor, maybe you. Call 844-442-2554 now to connect with a resource, someone who can help. We have members with the Columbus REACT team, DEA 360, and the Recovery Community Lighthouse Behavioral Health Solutions and Brightview. On our call four lines right now to take your call, that number 844-442-2554.
a local doctor is making a difference through his research on addiction, saying when we treat it like the disease it is, we will see better outcomes. The challenge is getting people to believe it and receiving the funding needed to combat it. Eddie Hawks reports. We have a long way to go to try to figure this out. But through his research, Dr. David Kassag is starting to, and he's making a difference along the way. Instrumental in developing Columbus's REACT program, or Rapid Response Emergency Addiction Crisis Team, the former Columbus Division of Fire Medical Director and Emergency Medicine Specialist says addiction is simple to define. So addiction is really the continued use of mind-altering substances despite adverse consequences of using them. But it's not so simple to treat, from alcohol and drug abuse to simply lighting up. Nicotine is one of the most powerful addicting substances that's known in the world. And so when someone wants to quit smoking, their brain is saying, hey, I need that nicotine. And, you know, I'm going to kind of act up a little bit until I get it. It's why quitting any addiction is so hard. He says through research, it was found while people choose to smoke, drink, or use drugs at one point in their life, it's their body's chemical reaction to it that keeps them going. A reaction not by choice. Our brains get rewired when we become addicted to a substance. And they have shown scientifically that there's different neuronal pathways that develop and that the brain becomes particularly sensitive to those addicting substances. Consequently, he says, you don't feel right unless you've had the substance, the brain now requiring what you're addicted to. It's not just that somebody decides to wake up and say, oh, I'm going to become an opiate addict or I'm going to start smoking two packs of cigarettes a day. He says to combat a drug epidemic, society needs to start treating addiction as it would any other disease. The addiction is the disease, just like diabetes is a disease, hypertension is a disease. Things that we treat diseases with sometimes require a medication. But medicine is not the only answer. Just like every person is different, so is every addiction. Genetics, how you were brought up, adverse childhood experiences. And then sometimes people self-medicate because they have an underlying psychiatric disorder like anxiety or depression. Medicine needs coupled with counseling, case management, and other things to support the medication. The REACT program in Columbus, which Kessick helped to create, encompasses all three, pairing social workers with emergency responders when someone overdoses. They're first treated at area hospitals and then linked with a treatment plan. While Kessig says some people can quit cold turkey, most people can't. He says it can take months, even years, to rewire the brain. With drugs like fentanyl now on the rise in our community and across the country, quitting is even harder due to the way the drug interacts with the brain. And it will bind to what we call the mu receptors in the brain much tighter than heroin will or even a prescription opioid leading to a more severe addiction, often with grim outcomes. I mean, this is the public health crisis epidemic. We, we saw how much money that we, we put on COVID, and rightfully so, but this is also killing a lot of people, and we need to really earmark more funding for developing new drugs of treatment, new ways for counseling. I know they're talking about vaccines for cocaine and opioids. There's a lot of research going on for this. During his experience with Columbus Fire as the emergency medical director, he's seen overdose after overdose. And our EMS personnel would sometimes go on the same individual and give them Narcan maybe two, three, four times in one day. But one thing that wasn't lost on him was who these people were, someone's family who deserved help. You know, this is a complicated thing. It's not just the addiction. There's mental health issues, socioeconomic issues. There's past, you know, adverse child experiences where, you know, people have been sexually abused, psychologically abused. And I think people have this idea in their brain of who an addict is. But an addict can be a physician, it can be a lawyer, it can be a business person, it can be a TV personality. You know, it can be anybody. It's not just some homeless person on the street. 
With a success rate of only one in 10, Dr. Kessick says treatment is on the right track, but he says it has a long way to go. In fact, he says it's up to the community, medical professionals to start making the strides toward a less addicted world. I was teaching and I was in between groups of students and uh, I got a call saying Michael was dead. Deborah Evans lost her husband and her firstborn son to the disease of addiction. When we come back, NBC4's Brad Johansson shares her remarkable story of strength and resilience. The opioid epidemic has affected so many in our community, leaving many with questions and or looking for help. Tonight we have people who can help standing by on our call for lines. Call 844-442. 2554 to reach out for assistance with treatment, support, or questions. The number again, 844-442-2554. As the battle with addiction is never ending, so too is the grief of losing a loved one to the disease. Deborah Evans lost her firstborn son two years ago to a heroin overdose. As Brad Johansson tells us, her battle now is for the family left behind and the fight for truth over stigma. What do you call this wall? My Hall of Fame. This is your Hall of Fame? <laughs> Deborah Evans can't help but smile when she talks about the oldest of her four grown children. He served in the Army. I served in Iraq. Um, he was married. He had four children. A life of service was Michael Posey's calling. And then he got deployed to Iraq for 18 months. What was that like? On my knees in prayer all the time. On her knees for the battle abroad and at home. And what was happening with your husband? Sadly, he, um, he passed away from uh, a heart problem, but it was brought on by um, the disease of addiction. It was alcoholism. She knew about the public war that Michael was fighting. The private one was just beginning. I think that although he didn't talk to me about it as much, I think he really regretted not being able to be here when his dad was so sick and passing. In Iraq, Michael jumped out of helicopters in his 18-month battle tour. Coming back was an adjustment, and he had the back problem, and he had some other medical issues with his um, kidneys, and um, he was on pain medicine for those two things. And back then, we didn't know that uh, oxycodone and Vicodin and opiates were addictive. That was in 2012. She found out about the heroin in 2014. Stigma says, my child was a junkie. Truth says, my child had a disease. What was happening with his family during that time? They were falling apart. Michael's wife became addicted as well. Over and over again, Deborah cared for them all. There would be heroin and things in my house. I had to not let them live with me. So How they, tough was that? Oh, I, they lived here four times before I could finally say no. What did it do to you? I realized I needed help. I found a support group. I'm really thankful to God for that because it was hard to find a support group. She found TAP, the addicted parent united just in time for the next bombshell to drop. In 2018, Michael's daughter, Taylor Ann, died from a heart condition, right in the midst of her father's battle with addiction. And within a year of that, Michael lost his battle. I was teaching and I was in between groups of students and uh, I got a call saying Michael was dead. The person, God love him, they just, that's the only way they knew how to say it, I guess. And Deborah didn't know how to live with it since the first year of loss also came with a COVID shutdown. Stigma says, my child was dirty. Truth says, my child was sick. In addition to TAP, she found Cornerstone of Hope. But there's so much stigma that a lot of parents don't talk or know there's help out there. Supporting families who've lost loved ones. These are my 12 grandchildren. That's Mike with his daughter, Taylor Ann. Two years ago, she never would have imagined she could be a spokesperson for getting through the pain. It just makes me feel like my son is there. And his daughter, and they're happy. 
For those left behind, the battle is never ending, fighting the war between perception and reality. Stigma says my child didn't matter. Truth says my child mattered deeply. And it's so true. Still today? Yeah, always. On the other side of the break, we will introduce you to the Columbus team, initially formed to save lives that is now changing lives. And if you or a loved one are impacted by this crisis, looking for support or assistance, we have people standing by to help right now. Call 844-442-2554. That's 844-44-CALL-4 to be connected to members of the Columbus REACT team, DEA 360, Lighthouse Behavioral Health Services, and other members of the recovery community. That number again, 844-442-2554. When an overdose happens, firefighters are often the ones who bring a person back from the brink of death. But for the Columbus Division of Fire, the life-saving mission doesn't end at the emergency room. NBC 4's Jamie Ostroff shows us a city program that's not just saving lives, it is changing them. In 2016, Columbus Fire Captain Matt Parrish saw a problem. We started looking at our Narcan numbers, our naloxone numbers, and the number of times we were administering had went through the roof. Narcan is a medication used to reverse the deadly effects of a drug overdose. Being a firefighter, we have a huge prevention mindset. You know, everything we do is geared around preventing the emergency. We were just taking people to the hospital, dropping them off, and before the medics were done writing the reports, they were leaving the ER again. So in an effort to prevent and not just respond to overdoses, Parrish helped launch the REACT program. It stands for Rapid Response, Emergency Addiction and Crisis Teams. This is why I signed up for the fire department. You know, I'm able to help people. Our team is able to help people and they're in their, you know, neediest hour. The teams are made up of firefighters like Brian Tolajeski, who come fully equipped. We carry first aid equipment, AED. We have some various things. Uh, we have uh, what's called recovery for life bags, which we give those to individuals that are in recovery and they have different items in it. Along with police officers and social workers, they visit patients in the hospital or in the community a day or two after the overdose. They'll try to engage that person at bedside before they have a chance to leave and get them hooked uh, up with treatment. Parrish says the program has helped thousands of people into addiction treatment, with hundreds participating in REACT's alumni group. I think everything comes down to relationships. Lieutenant Isaac Tolliver supervises the REACT program. I would say the biggest thing that I've learned is the honesty that people have when we go out to do the outreach. It's that openness, Tolliver says, that lets him know REACT can expand its reach in the community. REACT now hosts community events, and it just launched a mentorship program for kids. It gives us opportunity to spend time with people, really get to know them, build a relationship, and help them with the resources that they might need. The goal is to allow people to connect with first responders, building trust, and eventually making the community a safer place. And it's just a way to build resilience within the community, within the kids, to really try to break that generational cycle. Still to come, they've lost family members, their freedom, in one case, a leg to drug abuse. I sit down with members of a REACT support group for an honest look at addiction through the eyes of addicts. And a reminder for you, we do have experts on hand to help. If you have someone you care about, maybe that's a family member or a friend, coworker, neighbor, or maybe it's you. Call 844-442-2554 right now to connect with a resource that can help, 844-442-2554. No one knows the cost of addiction like an addict. You are about to meet seven people who bravely and honestly share what they've lost, the depths of addiction, and their long fight to regain control of their lives. You know, it just rapidly escalates, um, you know, from weekend to weekend and then it's every day. And, you know, other friends are going through life just fine, you know, starting families, businesses, et cetera, you know, except, you know, mine's, you know, in a dark basement getting high 
every day. So I started using at a real young age, like when I was 11. I was actually a functioning alcoholic addict person up until I went to a doctor and he prescribed me Percocets and methadone. The histories, the memories, the accounts are different, but at their core, the stories are all the same. Lives overtaken, consumed by alcohol and drugs. And when that hit, uh, I found out what that sensationable uh, obsession was about. And I was a successful businessman before, at that time, had my own uh, subcontracting business. And once I found the opiates, I couldn't stop and the opiates that was a craving that I couldn't get over after, you know, doing it for what, about a week. After that, I could. It I took was, a week? About a week, and then I was like, I had to have it every day to go to work, to get out of bed. Uh, and next thing you notice, bang, a friend showed me how to shoot up when I couldn't buy pain pills no more, and, and just downhill all the way. Friends so often guides on the path to addiction, to heroin. Um, I got introduced to pain pills and um, I come from a real small town. So like that's all there was to do out there. But when someone hears an 11 year old was able to get drugs, that to me is still shocking. How does an 11 year old access drugs? So um, I was actually prescribed Vicodin when I was 11 and 12 years old for um, menstrual cramps. and then, Vicodin for cramps? Yeah, and then a lot of my friends, from where they would get sport injuries, they would get prescribed Vicodin or Percocet, and like we were all under 15. But pills are not always enough, not always available. All my friends had already switched over because the pain pills were getting too expensive, and I got really, really sick and it was unlike anything I'd ever experienced in my life. And they were like, you know, if you just do this, it'll, it'll go away. And, you know, I went off to the races that day. Like, within a year of using heroin, like, I caught three felonies. I um, got kicked out of college. I lost my car, I lost my job. Um, I had three really close friends overdose and die. All within that first year. And then um, I've been in and out of rehabs, prisons, and treatment centers for the past 10. Again, in the back row, I see a lot of head nodding. Is this the story that, that is similar to what you went through too? Yeah, it's kind of similar. Um, I grew up in an alcoholic um, household. Um, my dad was an addict and alcoholic, so at an early age, I started seeing things like this. Um, and I got in an accident when I was 16 years old and I started taking prescription pain pills. And that was a game changer for me. Um, what got me here is um, I started committing a lot of crimes. First it started with like petty theft. Funny story, I was actually on the news before for um, a theft ring. Thankfully, this is gonna be different this time. Um, and I'm actually, as I sit today, I'm actually out on bond and I have been for 20 months. Uh, growing up, both my parents and uh, multiple family members are um, alcoholics and addicts. Today, my parents are sober, which is awesome. Uh, but growing up, I was exposed to a lot of that. I was exposed to prostitution, uh, drugs, alcohol, and uh, the street life, very young. Um, I would chase my mom down on Sullivan Avenue, begging her not to get in cars. She would be so intoxicated coming home, um, I would have to take care of my little brother. When I was six or seven, he was just a newborn baby. And as it often does, her family history repeated itself. I didn't know another way to cope with the pain, the emotional and physical abuse I had experienced my whole life. So drugs was naturally what I turned to. Heroin was not my drug of choice, crack cocaine was, and it took me 24 hours to lose everything. <laughs> Um, I laugh today because it's it, just the insanity of it. Um, but in that first 24 hour crack binge, I got like five felonies, went to jail. And while I was in jail that time, all I could think about was using again. Um, I didn't think about my consequences. I wasn't thinking about my son, my home, my job, my car. I lost it all in 24 hours. So when, when people hear that, that you already knew the immediate consequences, a single day, you knew the consequences, and yet you were still craving it, weren't you? Yes, 
Absolutely. Can you even explain that feeling of wanting something that desperately that you are willing to sacrifice your family, your child, and your job, and what you own to hit that high again? It's desperation, um, the worst kind of desperation. I don't think I can ex describe it to you. Um, the need to fill the void is so deep. Uh, it's indescribable. I, I can't really explain that to you, and I hope to God I never feel that ever again in my life. Well, I can relate to Mandy's story because, like, uh, everyone in my family, I come from generations of addicts and alcoholics. Um, you know, and if your parents don't know better, they don't do better, you know, until the pain pills come into my life and they were prescribed by a doctor. And that just started the whole obsession of everything. Um, and eventually I turned, I turned to heroin and, um, you know, it didn't take no time, maybe six months before I lost everything I had. When you say lost everything you had, relationships, job? All of it. Relationships, jobs, car, house. Um, and I lost myself, you know, like I had, it got to the point to where I didn't even care if I lived or died, you know, it was all about just getting that next one. Mine's a little different. I grew up, I was sheltered. Uh, the only thing I knew was marijuana and alcohol. That's all I knew growing up. I was 18, I had my son. My son was six years old, I had to have back surgery. Surgery followed by pain pills, and when they stopped working, a boyfriend who had a new way to relieve the pain, heroin. Come home from work one day and I was in excruciating pain. He's like, hey, try this. It was done after that. Took all the pain away. I wanted that every day. Wanted it every day for years, even after she lost custody of her son. Then her grandmother died the same day her boyfriend got arrested. It was like one o'clock in the morning, literally like six hours after he got arrested. I did a shot of heroin. I shouldn't have woke up. I did enough, I shouldn't have woke up. But something woke me up to my car being on fire. I had flames coming up my windshield. The next morning, I argued with my mom, my aunt, all of them. I'm not, I'm not going, I don't want to get clean yet. I want to go to my grandma's service, then I'll get clean. Was losing your leg drug related? Yes, yes, I was shooting up in my leg, got an abscess, tried to cut it out, got infected, gangrene, septic, uh, laying in the floor dying, and the girl I was with happened to come back just in time to call the fire uh, department, and I died in the squad four more times on the table. I'm here by the grace of God. Do you think that's what made you, was that your wake up call? No, uh, my wake up call was waking up in a van that I had purchased, broke down, had it parked in a church parking lot. Girl that I had staying in that with me at the time, like my part, partying buddy to help make sure I didn't OD, stepped on the Narcan to steal my dope to leave me for dead. And I woke up five hours later, pretty much, uh, I was dead. I'd relieved myself of everything. I'm pretty, you know, I was gone. And somehow I just happened to wake up five hours later. And so she robbed you while you were unconscious and you wake up to a new life. It's been a hard, hard struggle getting there though. You know, a couple more times back out, learning how to deal with emotions. Cause I started at nine years old the first time I got high to deal with feelings and traumas of molestations, abuse, you know. Each member of this support group is here because they reached that breaking point, or they were lucky enough to overdose and be revived by a member of the REACT team, first responders, firefighters and police who cared, who worked to get them into rehab and connect them with something elusive, hope, a plan to conquer their demons. People will hear this and think, you are a child chasing your mom and trying to stop her from getting in a stranger's car. When you look back at it now, are you angry at her? Are you angry at the circumstances? Are you angry at the drug? 
No, I don't have anger in my heart today. Uh, I worked through a lot of that through my recovery process uh, with a therapist. And how are you a mother now? Oh, my son's my world. Um, and speaking of him, that is why I got sober. Um, the last time I went to jail, I was served custody papers and read the conditions that my son was left in um, with his father, who's also an addict. Um, and that was my moment of clarity of, please help me, I don't want this anymore. And so he's my world, he's my best friend. I was homeless, I slept outside, I slept in cars. Um, you know, I'm not proud of that, but I can own that today and just know, you know, I, I've gotten help and I've worked on myself. Um, when you think back uh, to that person, the person who was getting high, homeless, living in cars, is it almost looking like someone who's separate from you? Is it like looking at a, a character in a movie or do you recognize yourself in that person? Sometimes it is, but like I wouldn't, I'm grateful for the experience that I had because I don't feel like I would be the person I am today if it wasn't for that. And um, I'm sure a lot of people here can relate to that. I know it probably doesn't sound normal to normal people, but um, recovery has showed me that, you know, I have a family, like this is my support. But can you describe what it's like to be at, that, at rock bottom and rebuild? It's beautiful, my life is lit. You know, it truly is. <laughs> Seriously, you know, it really is. Like, um, I came out of treatment, I had nothing. You know, absolutely nothing. I burned every bridge. You know, no one wanted to talk to me or be around me, and rightfully so. You know, starting from that bottom and then working your way up, you know, um, you, I, for me, I set like little goals, small little goals that I thought I could achieve. And I just kept achieving them. But my relationships are amazing today. Like I have a beautiful kid, man. He's so happy, and he's never, he's never seen me high. You know, um, he's never experienced uh, that other side of his dad. That's still there. You know. But will you talk to him about this? I, I he knows that I've been to prison. He knows that I'm a recovering alcoholic. Um, he knows that I'm super funny. Uh, <laughs> you know, he knows he knows everything about me. We we have a really transparent relationship. Started working the twelve steps of Alcoholics Anonymous. Um, next thing you know, things started coming together for me. I got a job. I work in recovery now. My family's back in my life. The ironic thing about being in recovery is we're grateful for those terrible situations. So like, I'm really grateful the man that trafficked me made my life so miserable that it was something I, I it was something I didn't want to go back to. And that pushed me into gear for changing. My sister actually overdosed and died in September. And I'd only been out of detox for like seven days at that point. And I was so scared. Um, I was so scared that I was going to run again and that my mom was going to bury her second child. And I couldn't do that to her. And you know, this community carried me through that hard time in my life. Like since I've gotten um, connected in the community, like I can talk about my problems and the issues that I have that face me on a daily, you know? and. No matter what, like I don't have to get high over that because I have plenty of people around me that are like working towards the same goal. What I want to say is like recovery is is amazing. Like it's fun. You know, we we're a community. We're really, really, really tight knit. Um, there's so much opportunity for growth. You know, there's so much opportunity to to change and be a different person. It's it's truly just it takes that first step to say okay. I'm ready to make this change. All you have to do is ask, and there's a whole community of us just waiting to help you find your way out of the darkness like we did. The Columbus REACT team is an amazing partnership of multiple departments working together to make sure members of our community get the treatment and assistance they need. If you would like to speak with one of them or a member of the Columbus recovery community, you can call right now. 844-442-2554. Reaching children at an early age and linking them with role models will hopefully encourage them to make good decisions, ideally keep them from crime and drugs. That's part of the purpose of a mentorship program through After School All-Stars. It's called React Buddies. 
The mentors are first responders who teamed up with their mentees during this recent kickoff. Any trauma in the home, and that could be a number of things. We talk about complex development trauma here. So our, our, our mentors, uh, as far as first responders, they go through training. They go through a, a five-hour training. That is a requirement of trauma responsive strategies. And then they do an orientation. There are just about 40 mentees and 35 mentors. I met one Columbus firefighter who knows the importance of being involved in the lives of young people. When I was younger, I remember seeing fire trucks go by and thinking, that's pretty cool. And I'd always see a male um, driving. Now Asia Ferris drives the trucks and recruits others to do the same. She's been with the Columbus Division of Fire for 10 years. I have a lot of energy <laughs> and I love the kids. So she's joined a new effort to pair first responders with young people. The goal, help them succeed in life. Initially, Ferris had trouble connecting with her mentee, a 15-year-old girl whose family moved around a lot. How's this process been going for you? A lot of times I was speaking with other relatives that were relaying messages, and that actually is still happening now. Um, not as frequent, though, because she takes the initiative to reach out to me sometimes. After School All Star strives to make sure kids who many call at risk don't fall through the cracks. It links those at least 10 years old with a buddy. That buddy will provide guidance, support, and also those re resiliency components to the mentee. This initiative, again, like I stated, is one of those solutions that can strengthen our communities and that can usher in some type of hope. As for Ferris and her mentee. She is learning to trust me and share with me what her needs are. She knows that safety is my number one priority for all of us and her and her family. And she knows I'm a resource. And if I can share with her about this career and it becomes something she become interested in because she sees me, the same brown face, this woman, you know, that's representing, then why not? Why not? Well, we are facing the worst drug crisis in Ohio's history, and that's why it's more important than ever for us to talk with our loved ones and with each other about drug misuse. And so we've put links to resources on our website, NBC4i.com, for treatment, support, and information on how you can open the discussion about misusing drugs. And we hope that you'll join Carrie and me tonight for NBC4 at 11, and we sure hope you tap into those resources if you or your family need them. Have a great night.